So Christmas has passed. You celebrated, right? You celebrated Christmas some way, so, somehow, and maybe, maybe you celebrated in a big way. At, at, here at Oakwood, we celebrate in a big way when we do Bethlehem Live and we have the, 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 the Christmas series and we have the Christmas Eve celebration. It's all big and it's grand and it's great to do that. But typically, we ignore the sequel, right? We ignore the sequel. There's a Christmas sequel, and, and we typically ignore it. It's like what we do. Like, isn't there like a new Star Wars movie out? You know, I saw the first one back in the 70s. Yeah, I remember that one. And maybe saw one more, but after that, it's like, pfft. The sequels never measure up. They never, how about Rocky? That kind of dates me, right? That's like, is that the 80s? Dun, 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 dun. Yeah, and so you, you see the movie Rocky, and then they have the sequel of Rocky 1, Rocky 2, Rocky 3, Rocky 4. How, how many were there? Five, six? Seven, I don't know, but none of the sequels were as good as the first one. Or Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings is like, I mean, those movies are so long. It's like for crying out loud, in the movie. And do you need a sequel to that? And some of you are like, oh, I'm greatly offended. I love it. Okay. But <clears throat> there's a Christmas sequel coming. And the Christmas sequel is going to be even better than the first one. Do you know that? The, the sequel is coming. Did you know that the Bible not only predicted Jesus would come the first time, but it predicts that Jesus will come the second time? 22 of the 27 books of the New Testament speak of the return of Jesus Christ. Some of you are probably wondering, now when is the PowerPoint going to kick in? Well, this is like a throwback Sunday. No PowerPoint. Okay? So if you go, well, Roger, I, want, I, I, I would like to have the... If you want the notes, then you just put that on your card and I'll send you my sermon notes. Um, I, I do tease and say, if you want to sign, though, it's going to cost you. Um, but, if, but I'm going to run through this, this long list, okay? Here we go. Um, Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. The disciples all say to Jesus, what will be the sign of your coming? What is it gonna, what's it going to look like when you come back? How, how will we know? And Jesus said, you will see the Son of Man. That Jesus referred to himself all the time as the Son of Man. You will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds in great power and glory. That's what you're going to see. And Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all give like a whole chapter of their book to the second coming of Jesus Christ. In John chapter 14, Jesus said to his disciples, I'm going to go away. And they're sad. He says, I'm going to go away, but... If I go away, I'm coming back, and I'm going to take you to be with me. That's what Jesus said to them. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus ascends into heaven. You know, so, so we, um, we celebrate Christmas, and we said last week or the week before that, that if God became flesh, then everything else in the Scripture begins to make sense. If Jesus is God in the flesh, then everything that he said, everything that he did, everything written about him begins to make sense. So when it says in Acts chapter 1 that Jesus is standing there with his disciples 40 days after his resurrection, and it says that he ascended into heaven, he bodily went up into heaven, and we go, well, how could that happen? That can't. The scripture says that's what happens with Jesus. And he disappears, and as there's, they're all looking up there like this, angels come, and the angels say, why are you guys looking up into heaven? This same Jesus He's going to come back just like you saw him go. He went up bodily. He was visible. When he returns, it's going to be bodily. It's going to be visible. He's going to come back. That's what Acts says. In Romans chapter 8, it's implied. Four of these uh, um, uh, books imply the return of Jesus. The other ones um, state it clearly. Romans chapter 8 says, For the creation waits, e waits with eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. That the scripture is clear that when Jesus comes, every one of his followers will be revealed with him in glory. So Romans chapter 8 is implying second coming. It's implied in 1 Corinthians 15 where Paul writes, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. We will not all die. But we will all be changed in a flash in the blink of an eye. That that happens when Jesus comes. It's implied in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. For us to appear before him, he's, he's to return. Philippians chapter 3, we saw this about five, six weeks ago. Our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians chapter 3, when Christ appears, you will appear with him. A few weeks ago, we were in 1 Timothy chapter 6. We looked at verses 15 and 16, not 14. And 14 says this, that we're to be those who are obedient until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy chapter 4. 
It talks of Christ Jesus in view of his appearing. And even as I'm looking through my list, I left out Titus. Titus says, we're to be those who are looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. Hebrews chapter, chapter um, 9, uh, we often will quote verse 27, which says, It's appointed unto man once to die, but after this comes judgment. If we're sharing scripture, we're sharing the gospel, we will refer to that verse. But the next verse says, He will appear a second time. James chapter 5 says, Be patient until the Lord's coming. First Peter chapter 5 says, When the chief shepherd appears. Well, who's the chief shepherd? It's Jesus. Second Peter chapter 3, the, the scoffers would say, well, where is this coming, he predicted. Where is it? I don't know, Second Peter is written 20, 30 years after Jesus rose from the dead. And, and the scriptures are saying that Jesus is going to return and people are going, well, where is it? He hasn't come back. People would say the same thing today. But Second Peter is talking about the coming, the second coming of Jesus. First John chapter 3, when Christ appears, we shall see him. It's implied in Jude 21 where Jude writes, as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you eternal life, that he's bringing that with him. And then you get to the book of Revelation. Book of Revelation, you could take the whole book talking about Jesus' return. Chapter 1 specifically says that every eye will see him. Every eye is going to see him. You get into chapter 19 and it's talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ with detail. You go all the way to the end of the book to chapter 22. The second to last verse of the Bible, Jesus said, or Jesus says, yes, I'm coming quickly. We, we don't understand quickly like Jesus does. Okay, so we're going 2,000 years. That doesn't sound quick. But Jesus is outside of time. He says, I'm coming quickly. So the, the New Testament is just full of showing that Jesus is going to come back. It's said again and again. And then these two letters, 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians, as we've been going through Route 66, we've been trying to make our way through all the books of the Bible. Sometimes we do a series on a whole book, or sometimes it's just one sermon like today, which is just going to look at 2 Thessalonians. This, I believe, is number 56 out of 66. So, so over the last seven, eight years, we've been plodding through, and, and we're going we're gonna to get there walking through all the Scripture. But 1 Thessalonians, and again, I'm just going to summarize. The end of every chapter, 1 Thessalonians, talks about the second coming of Jesus. Chapter 1 ends with this, to wait for his son from heaven. Chapter 2 ends talking about hope in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes. Chapter 3 ends, when, G when the Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. Chapter 4 ends with five verses talking about the rapture, or the being caught up of the church. And it says, the Lord himself will come down from heaven. Chapter 5 says that we are to be blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then you come to 2 Thessalonians 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. In verse 10, it says, On the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at among, uh, among all those who have believed. Chapter 2, verse 1. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him. Uh, chapter 2, verse, end of verse 8. It says, By the splendor of his coming. That these, these letters are talking about the coming of Jesus. They're, they're talking about he's coming back. But the problem is in verse two, uh, chapter 2, it says, Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching allegedly from us, whether by a prophecy or by a word of mouth or by letter, asserting that the day of the Lord has already come. That Paul writes 1 Thessalonians, he talks about the second coming of Jesus. It's a few months later that he writes them again because somebody had said, or were, they were teaching that Paul said, well, Jesus already came. He already came and you missed it. And that made him upset. So Paul's writing them saying, hey, that's, that's not true. I didn't write that. It's not true. It's not true that Jesus has already come. But they were afraid that he had. You, you see, if Jesus had already come, then the people in this city of Thessalonica, the believers there, it's a city in, in northeastern Greece, they were stuck. They, they would be stuck in verse 4 of chapter 1. Therefore, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and faith in all the persecutions and trials you are enduring. It goes on and says um, at the end of verse 5, uh, talking about uh, their suffering. They're suffering for the, for the kingdom of God. And it's like, when, when Jesus returns, the suffering is supposed to be done. 
The trials, the persecution is supposed to be done. And if Jesus already came back and they're still experiencing persecution and trials and suffering and, and trouble and there's no relief, they're stuck. They're stuck. It says in, uh, yeah, in verse 7, and give, you, and give relief to those to you who are troubled as well, that there's no relief. Jesus came, there's no relief. They've missed out. And it's shaking them. In um, verse 7 again, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. How'd they miss it? Jesus is coming in blazing fire. How did they miss it? Sometimes it's like, um, when, it, when it says in the scripture, every eye will see him. Or it says like, he's, what Paul's trying to say here in Thessalonians, you're not going to miss it. How is it? How is it we're going to see Jesus return? I mean, his, his feet are going to stand in, in Scripture, it says, on the Mount of Olives. How, how's that? That's in Jerusalem. That, that's a long way off. How are we going to see that? I don't know. But when he returns, it says, every eye is going to see him. Somebody, some people might say, well, that's because we have television and satellite stuff. No, 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 no. It's going to be bigger than that. Every eye is going to see him, and every eye is going to know who he is. But they're afraid that they've, they've missed it. In verse 9. Uh, they will be punished, talking about those who do not obey the gospel, do not believe. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might on the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at. That idea that he's going to come and he's going to, he's going to administer justice. They, they don't see that yet. They're stuck. Did they miss it? He's going to be marveled at. It's, it's going to be a glory that's experienced with him. It says in verse 10, glorified in his holy people, marveled at. They missed it. That's what they're feeling, like they've missed it. And Paul wants them to know they, they didn't miss it. He, he, wants to, he wants to clarify. Wouldn't that be awful if you as a follower of Jesus Christ found out that Jesus Christ came and you didn't know about it? It'd be awful. And so Paul writes 2 Thessalonians to take away this, this fear, to take away this, this, um, this thing that was scaring them. So here's what I believe Paul wants us to know from 2 Thessalonians. Number one, Jesus is going to return to earth. Again, 22 of the 27 books of the New Testament tell us that Jesus is coming back. 22 of the books of the New Testament say there is a Christmas sequel. Okay, There is a Christmas sequel. We celebrate his coming at Christmas, and we're going to celebrate his coming again. What day is that going to be? I don't know. In chapter 2, it talks about the day of the Lord. Is in, the, in the scripture, the day of the Lord is either one day or it's, it's, a, it's a segment of time. So the scripture teaches, first, we can look in 1 Thessalonians, and you can read that on your own, chapter 4. It talks about this thing that we call the rapture of the church. It, it, the word is to be caught up. That a trumpet will sound and those who place their faith in Christ will be caught up in the clouds with Christ. Some say that we're caught up in the clouds with him and immediately then we return to this earth with Jesus and that's the second coming. Others would look at Scripture and they would say, well, there's the being caught up. But Daniel and Revelation also talk about this seven-year seven tribulation period. That there's this period of time where things are very bad on the earth. Okay, And then at the end of those seven years, Jesus returns and sets up his kingdom. Now, which one is it? Well, I think it's the second one myself. I think there's two parts to the day of the Lord. The rapture and then the coming and the tribulation between. Could I be wrong? Could it be all at once? Yeah. So what's the most important thing that Jesus wants us to know, what God wants us to know? Paul wants to be clear. Jesus is coming back. Jesus said, nobody knows the exact time I'm coming. Jesus said, I don't even know. The Father knows. So if Jesus doesn't know, why should we spend our time trying to figure that out? Don't worry about that part. Because Jesus in the Gospels, he says, here's what you do to get ready for the coming. Just be ready. Just be ready. Be serving me. Be following me. Be ready. So the one thing that's for certain is there's a sequel to the Christmas story. And Jesus is coming back. That's number one. Second thing that Paul wants us to know would be we will not miss the second coming of Jesus Christ. We've read verses 1 and 2 out of uh, 2 Thessalonians, talking about how there was people were asserting that Paul said Jesus had already come, and Paul's telling them, that's not what I said, that's not what I wrote, the letter wasn't from me, it's not right. And then he goes on to say that there are certain things that must happen before Jesus returns. I'm going to begin in verse 3. 
Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs. There's going to be a great rebellion against God. You might say, well, there's a rebellion against God right now. I know. But there's a greater rebellion against God that's coming. And the man of lawlessness is revealed. Well, who's the man of lawlessness? I don't know, but it's the man that is characterized by lawlessness. There's this man of lawlessness who's going to step forward. Verse 4, he will oppose and exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. All of us struggle with arrogance at one point or another or regularly. We all have those struggles with pride. We know there are people in our world that are very arrogant. But to be arrogant, to proclaim yourself to be God, that's what this man who's come and this man of lawlessness, he's going to do. Verse 5 says, Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things? And now you know what is holding him back, so that he may be revealed at the proper time? For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. What's holding the man of lawlessness back? It's the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit dwells within believers, right? Scripture's clear about that. The Holy Spirit dwells within us. When the church is raptured and all the believers are taken out, the Holy Spirit's gone, and there's no one to hold back this man of lawlessness. Because it does say there in, in the end of verse 7 of chapter 2, until he the one holding things back until he is taken out of the way. It says in verse 8, Then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie that this one who comes will be a miracle worker. When it talks about uh, that, the wonders that serve the lie, what's the lie? Well, the lie is back up in verse 4, where he pro- proclaims himself to be God. And he's working these miracles to try to prove to people that he's God. And all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They, they perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie. That those who've rejected to listen to the truth of God's word, God will allow them to believe this lie. They will fall for this man of lawlessness, believing that he is God on earth. Paul's trying to make sure they understand, that we understand, that we will not miss the second coming of Jesus Christ. We're not going to miss it. And when we read those verses again, when it says in verse 7 of chapter 1, He's going to be revealed with blazing fire with his powerful angels the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and marveled at. And it speaks of it again and again in the scriptures. Jesus wins. Jesus is going to win. So Paul wants us to know Jesus is going to return to earth. Paul wants us to know that we will not miss the second coming. And Paul wants us to know that we are to stay faithful. What do we do in light of his coming? Do we try to figure out exactly when he's coming back? No. What do we do? You and I are to be those who are faithful. Verse 15 of chapter 2. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold fast to the teachings we passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. What does being faithful look like? Stand firm on Scripture. Stand firm on the Scripture. Somebody might have said to you at Christmas time, so you really believe that Jesus is God in the flesh? And your response would be, yes. That's what the scripture says. Or so if somebody said to you, well, do you really believe that Jesus Christ is going to come back? The answer is, yeah, well, that's not going to happen. Well, remember, if Jesus is God in the flesh, that makes everything fit together. It makes everything fit together. We're to stand firm on the word of God. And we've seen today, real fast anyway, that the New Testament says that Jesus is coming back. Stand firm on the word of God. Um, Chapter 3, verse 1, As for other matters, brothers and sisters, pray for us that the message of the Lord may spread rapidly and be honored just as it was with you. Pray that we may be delivered from wicked and evil people, for not everyone has faith. He's saying here to make sure that that we stay on mission. The mission continues, the, the message can, needs to continue to go out. Stay on mission. That's how you stay faithful. Remember God's faithfulness, verse 3. But the Lord is faithful and he will strengthen you. That we're to be faithful because he's faithful. And then we're to live a disciplined life. Verse 4, we have confidence in the Lord that you are doing and will continue to do the things we command. We're called to walk in obedience. You and I are called to walk in obedience 
to the scriptures. That's what living a disciplined life is about, being obedient to the scriptures. We are to be those who persevere. Verse 5, may the Lord direct your hearts into God's love and Christ's perseverance. We have Christ's example that he persevered. He walked by faith. He accomplished the mission that the Father had for him. We're to do the same. Verse 6, uh, this one I've entitled, don't waste your life. Do your job. Don't waste your life. Do your job. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you, brothers and sisters, to keep away from every believer who is idle and disruptive and does not live according to the teaches, teaching you receive from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. We were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we worked night and day, laboring and, toil, and toiling, so that we would not be a burden to any of you. We did this not because we do not have the right to such help, but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you to imitate. For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule, the one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. I believe he's saying here, don't waste your life, do your job. It's not like, oh, Jesus is going to come back, and he says he's going to come back quickly, so I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to wait for him to come, and then I'll just have everybody else support me. We're not to do that. that that's not being faithful. We're to not waste our life. We're to do our job. Whatever your job is, do your job. Do your job and honor him in it. Exercise tough love in those same verses, 6 through, uh, with six through 10. Sometimes you need to say to somebody, you're wasting your life. You're wasting your point. We're to point it out, to point it out in love. If, if someone says, I, I need help, and maybe they do need help, but if they're refusing to work, the verse says if they refuse to work, if they're able to work and they refuse to work, there's nothing that's keeping them from working. They provide for themselves. Don't help them. Whoa. It's, it's almost like it sounds harsh. It's not. It's just this tough love thing that needs to take place. Verse 13. And as for you, brothers and sisters, never tire of doing what is good. Do what's good. We're called to do what's that's being That's being faithful with waiting for the coming of Jesus Christ. Paul wants us to know that Jesus is going to return to earth. We will not miss the second coming. And we are to stay faithful. The one thing today is this. If uh, you loved what happened that first Christmas, you love rehearsing it to Christmas time comes and, and so, so many people are just so excited to do Christmas. Just You want to do Christmas? If that's where you're at, here's the one thing. The sequel is going to be way better. At the sequel, the Christmas sequel is going to be way better than the first one. How can that be? Because you and I are going to be there. Father, it's good and it's right for us to pay a lot of attention and, and uh, rehearse the first coming of Jesus Christ. But what we tend to shortchange is the second coming of Jesus. And your word is very clear that he's coming and we're to keep our eyes, our, the eyes of our spirit focused upon the return of Jesus Lord, we'd pray. We'd ask it would be today. That would be great. Because it's going to be the greatest day ever. And if we think that celebrating Christmas now is really something, just wait till we celebrate that day that you come back. What that date is, we're going to celebrate that day. Thank you for the promise of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Next steps memorize 2 Thessalonians 3.16. Uh, second, get ready to marvel. Because when Jesus returns, you're going to say stuff like, this is awesome! If you're not signed up for community Bible experience, that starts in like, I think, two weeks. So get your Bibles, get your Bibles. And then uh, if you could do this for, I was going to say for me, you don't need to do it for me, do it for yourself. Read this week, second, first and second Thessalonians in one sitting. It'll take you 10, 15 minutes, something like that. Thanks. The last verse of that song says, when Christ shall come, with shout of acclamation. Hey, some of you are really into the bowl games you've been watching, and maybe you watched that playoff game last night, or you're going to watch the Packers today. And the end of the game, uh, the horn goes off, right? <clears throat> game's over. One day it's going to be a trumpet. It'll be way bigger than any game you're watching. 
You watch these fans. They're all excited. Their team won, and they're, yeah, they're jumping up and down. They won't be able to sleep. They wouldn't miss it for the world. Everybody who lost, they're like this. They're dejected. They're crying. One day, the trumpet sounds, and Jesus wins, and we're going to be there with him. We're going to be excited about it. Oh, yeah. So it makes me think, wow, Roger, your benediction is a little quieter than that one. (laughs) Now may the God of peace himself, the one we profess to believe in, the one who's going to return, now may the God of peace himself give you peace at all times. No matter the arrogance or the, the, the tension or the confusion of the days ahead, now may the God of peace himself give you peace at all times in every way with God, with others, with, each, with yourself. Now may the God of peace give you, all, give you peace at all times in every way. The Lord be with you all. Amen. Amen.